Okay, thank you for coming today. Um, so, obviously, the, uh, the subject of today is about hidden history. I've called it part one because there's so much hidden history, it's not enough to cover in two hours. Uh, we'll probably need uh, another 25 hours, 30 hours to cover at least probably 70% of it. So, just to start off, we're going to cover Akhenaten on the Hyksos. Um, and a bit of the occult history of secret society and uh, Judeo-Christian uh, religions and the sort of cult history. So this may be challenging to some of you, some of this information, but this, this history is by archaeologists and historians that have been on the fringes of the academic realm who have been voicing these things for the last 40, 50 years, some even 100 years, uh, including Freud, as well. Uh, Freud did a lot of work into uh, Jewish history and uncovered the origins of Judaism and Judeo, uh, where the Judaism actually stemmed from. So the important thing to remember is that where we have to, to know where we are today, we have to know what history has been hidden from us through the academic uh, institutions and through the uh, Judeo-Christian religions, including Islam as well. Um, so that's what's dis been distorted over the, uh, the ages. So I, wanna, I want to make sure that I'm, I'm a researcher, so a lot of the credit goes to Michael Tessaria. There's great information and references to various historians. He's cited very respectable scholars that are well-known names, uh, some lesser known but very well respected in, in history. So I'd like to give him a shout out because uh, I don't want to plagiarize anybody and claim that it's my own. So um, going forward, these are some of the references. So we have various works, uh, John Van Setters, uh, yeah, uh, you've got Ahmed Osman uh, from even uh, Martin Luther and various other writers that's written about the history of the Hyksos, um, very respected scholars and archaeologists that have been shunned and hidden away from, from the history books uh, in the mainstream. As we know, history is written by the victors, and we know who the victors are today um, that are running the show. So the, the main thing to... Um, get in the framework of how they control the narrative of history is that they emit, so key events in history that didn't happen are downplayed or completely removed from, from the history books and then they invent, this involves uh, inventing tribes, uh, certain people, events that never existed or happened in history. Uh, the other, uh, the third one that they do is chronology. They mess around with the timeline. So you'll see some of it in the presentation today. Uh, so they're muddled on purpose, like king lists are rearranged. So we don't get the right timelines of when events took place or how long ago they were. Uh, and the lifespans of, of historic individuals are modified. So dates for key operations, such as building projects, a lot of that has been really been decimated from the history books. Uh, a lot of them today you'll find in the Vatican, in the Vatican Library. Um, and there's been various witness, witnesses and people that have been in, in the libraries and have seen these documents as well. Uh, so yeah, things like coronations, marriages, birth and so on are tampered with. So first, we're going to start with this character here, Akhenaton. Um, so key facts to know about Akhenaton is that he, was, he ruled during the 18th dynasty in Egypt. We're looking at around, historians dispute this, some say it was 1300 BC, uh, where the, um, uh, the Bible or the, the Christian uh, historians would say that it was 1600 BC because it lines up with Ramesses II, uh, with the story of Moses. So that's something to bear in mind. He was an Israelite pharaoh, and we're going to see why he was an Israelite pharaoh. He was lionized by Western and Egyptian scholars, 
uh, from the mainstream academic institutions. Uh, his cult of Atom, I call it Eton as well, because um, Ralph Ellis goes into the pronunciation of how um, Atom should be pronounced in the Egyptian uh, scriptures, especially the hymn uh, to Atom, which is a, a clay tablet, or I believe it's a clay tablet, a hymn for the god Atom, for Akhenaten. That was written back then in, in around circa between 1500 BC uh, to 2000 BC. Um, it, we'll find that it's identical to the pre-Diluvian Brotherhood of the Snake. This is to do with a bit of my history, where I'm from, uh, and a Sumerian history of uh, Anu, Enki, and Enlil. Um, he was also the inventor of monotheism. So, the Hyksos pharaohs of Egypt. So Akhenaten, according to both the revised biblical history and the king lists of Egypt, this is where all this is referenced from, uh, was a direct descendant of the Hyksos pharaohs. Um, he was so strongly influenced by the priests of Heliopolis, who were also known as the Hyksos priests. Uh, they, the deity has to be a direct result of their influence. It is simply the Hyksos belief system under another name. Akhenaten's father, Amenhotep III, must have had many sympathies with his belief in the Aton as well, but he never dared openly promote the new cult. There's a lot of uh, great books by Ralph Ellis. I really recommend you look into his works. He's um, referenced a lot of archaeologists that have found uh, all, these ref all these references in history through the King's List, through various... Um, uh, tablets and, and uh, scriptures and hieroglyphs and so on that's documented uh, Akhenaten's rise and fall and luckily there has been some that survived because um, during the time of his reign and between the 13th dynasty where we're looking at around sort of between 1800 BC up until around 1500 some say 1300 again uh, like I mentioned before, the timelines have been distorted. So we're, we're investigating into when the actual timelines happen, and we're going to find out a bit more about that. But I really recommend Ralph Ellis's work. Another thing to keep in mind with Ralph Ellis is that he is a Freemason. Okay, so we've got to take some of his perspectives uh, that are, I would say, biased towards the Freemasonic uh, lodge, lodges, or him as a Freemason. So... We can take some of his uh, interpretations to be a bit biased towards his own belief system as well. And this is the thing to, to do when we research anything. We have to ourselves individually discern because uh, a lot of history is subject to interpretation. Just as, as, as with most things like biblical texts or poetry or philosophy. So it's really up to you as an individual to to discern for yourself and I'm just presenting information here from great scholars and, and also my own interpretation that I'm going to add on, on to this as well so renegade pharaoh Akhenaten or Akhenaten as well he's referred to was known as the son of the sun Aton or Eton the real king of the Jews or the Hyksos, because again, this is another distortion, again, of referring themselves to Jews when, in fact, it's completely separate. They're, they're separate from the Jews. Jews, like any other religion, Christian or Muslim, completely different. But they associate them, them with the Jews when, in fact, it was the Hyksos. And obviously, these Hyksos, as I mentioned before, uh, when we talked about the Brotherhood of the Snake, when we, um, I'll do this in a part two, the Hidden History part two, where I'll cover Sumerian history and we can go and delve into deeper the origins of the story of Enki and Enlil, the epics of Gilgamesh, which also actually references the story of Moses in, in the clay tablets of, of the epics of Gilgamesh. So this story is actually older than even this Egyptian telling. Uh, he was the master of the Levites. So these are uh, people that stem from the North Eastern Nile Delta and of the 12 tribes under his dominion. So we hear this 12 
The 12 is a lot. Uh, Jesus had 12 disciples. In Islam, in the Shia sect of Islam, we also get um, uh, the 12 as, as well. So after Muhammad, you have, the, you have Ali and the other 11 dis uh, disciples of Muhammad as well. Uh, not a lot of people know that <laughs> unless you're, you're part of the, the, or grew up in the Shia kind of uh, upbringing like I did. His biography is the Bible, his instrument of torture, <laughs> uh, Judeo Christianity, and uh, his fault of Atom was and is, again, identical to the pre diluvian brotherhood of the snake. You know what pre diluvian means? Uh, it means pre flood. So pre. Pre flood. It really stems to ancient times. It goes way back. So we can only find references to these people um, in history within the limited amount of information we have that survived the, uh, the, the, the complete uh, perversion of history, of real history. Uh, his minions are the Vatican, the Illuminati, Templars, Royals, and British Israelites. Uh, the Atonists or Etonists have expertly employed their age-old symbols to indicate their presence to the symbolically literate. So I'll be doing a talk later about, um, uh, about symbolism and how we can interpret symbolism so that when we go out into like, the centre of London, you're able to look at these symbols and be able to interpret them better because you'll understand the meanings behind the symbols. And symbolic literacy is really powerful. Because through that, you can create your own symbols. And symbols are very powerful emblems for ourselves in our lives to use as well. Um, the Atonists, Etonists have expertly up, employed to from their, from their basis of Operation Tanis, which is northeastern Nile Delta of Egypt, Alexandria, Rome, and today London, New York, and Washington, D.C., and through their lieutenants, they control the world. Michael Tassarin. His great work as well, I thoroughly recommend Michael Tassarin's work. He's done extensive research, and what I'm doing here in this presentation is pretty much condensing um, into sort of bite-sized format where you can um, be, have your senses alerted so you can, you know, in your own time, if you want to research this or find an interest. Uh, but the, at the very least, I'll give you the layout, lay of the land, so to speak, and then you can go and delve into this yourself. So, amongst the greatest riddles of, um, of Jewish prehistoric times, this is a quote by Sigmund Freud from his, his works into, uh, it's, not, it's quite blurry there, um, Master and Monotheism, um, I believe it's called Moses and Monotheism is the book by Sigmund Freud. And a lot, a lot of people know this actually. Sigmund Freud um, was uh, more of a, he actually got a lot of uh, awards in, in being a historian and a, and, a, and a researcher before he was known as a psychiatrist. So not a lot of people know this, but um, he was a very respect, respected scholar at the time. Um, but sadly, over time, he had to fold to the, to the establishment. And, um, but a lot of his work shouldn't be discounted, even his psychological work. He laid out a lot of uh, questioning as well into the human psyche. But that's, a, that's another topic for another time that we're going to cover at, at a later point. So, uh, among the greatest riddles of Jewish prehistoric times is that concerning the antecedents of the Levites, they are said to have been derived from one of the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Levi, but no tradition has ever ventured to pronounce on where that tribe originally dwelt, or what portion of the conquered country of Canaan had been allotted to it. They occupied most important priestly positions, but yet they were distinguished from the priests. A Levite is not necessarily a priest, it is not the name of a caste. So that's something to bear in mind when we go forward into this uh, investigation and, and this presentation. And uh, not, another thing, I, I quite like um, to research etymology and words. And if you notice Levi, if you rejumble that, what's that an anagram for? Legal. Yeah. 
you have evil, you have live as well, or life. So, uh, and the word vile as well, that's another play on that, on that word. Interesting, isn't it, how these, um, these they, words... They play with words quite a bit, though, as well, don't they? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. They, they, that's part of the, yeah. the whole... Yeah. Um, words are spells. Yeah. Words are spells. Words are spells. Yeah. Yeah. And they use them in, in, as the we know them. Yeah. yeah. But that's how they play with the English language, and that's why the English language has is, is kind of gone from ye old English to, to what we have today which is mixed as well. We have a lot of uh, mixtures of uh, Indo-European languages into the English language, French influences, Latin, uh, even Arabic is in the, in the English language. When we look up etymologies. So, Akhenaton's concern was not, uh, as has been insinuated by academic sycophants, um, to spiritualize the country. In effect, it was to despiritualize it. And it, his, his demented concern was to have the God of his Levitical family be everyone's God. Okay, so it's just, you know, it's another sort of taking the ancient spiritual practices to know that God is within us, or what you want to say, the prime creator is within us through our soul, our spirit but they want to claim it to their own and externalize themselves as deities so that we are disempowered in ourselves and we have no authority and we are enslaved easily and so on and so forth. Um, few in Egypt shared his sentiments or thought that this was a good idea. He had support only from other members of his family, from henchmen and court guards from foreign parts hired to protect him and from certain Hyksos some priests at Heliopolis, Avaris, and Memphis. Um, Avaris, I don't know if you've heard of Avaris. Um, we get uh, in Arthurian legends, Avon, Avon, Avon. So this, is to, this also refers to Avaris. And this is why these legends were made and these stories were made. It all refers back to this time in Egypt, this particular time in Egypt. And Avaris is actually renamed, and we'll go into that later on, a, on another slide. So, pronunciation. According to Ralph Ellis, Aton is not a good pronunciation of it. It's spelt with a reed clip, uh, something that is used in language. A reed clip is like an accent on top of a letter, which changes the pronunciation of it. And a reed clip is more like an E, so it sounds more like Eton. Does that sound familiar? Right? Eton College and all the politicians, where do they go? Etonians, right? Funny how that's a coincidence. Also, supposedly it's always uh, 1500 year old college, I believe. Isn't it? Oh, yeah, it's quite old. It's, it's, yeah. it's probably one of the oldest. Yeah, you know, aside Cambridge. from Cambridge and Oxford, you know, it's one of the oldest. It's been there for, for a few hundred years now. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. It's a little town, isn't it? It is as well, yeah. And, you know, we'll see like, <coughs> how some of the names also have been changed. The, the names um, that used to exist here in, in England and, and parts of the British Isles, Scotland and so on, were changed eventually. Um, and they all kind of had the connotations of these Etonists. Mm. Something about Scotland and the license. Yeah. It's a very deep sea. Yeah. There is also a connection between the Scots and the Egyptians and the Celts and the yeah. Irish. Which I'll go into as well a bit later. Yeah. So, to start with, we start with the story of Adam and Eve, and we see the parallels here in Akhenaton's story. Uh, according to Ralph Ellis, Genesis is the middle of the story. So, um, this, and when we read the Bible and we read Genesis and so on, we we read a a mythological story of creation, the creation myth. It's written in that sort of framework. Um, So it has all these uh, fantastical imagery of, of, uh, you know, Satan as a serpent in the garden and the apple being plucked from a tree. Um, What it actually means, the apple, because there's two two trees, you have the tree of life and you have the tree of knowledge, which we are, I think you're aware of in some of the biblical texts. But uh, the tree of knowledge, according to, to um, Ralph Ellis, is also a uh, family tree. 
So the plucking of that fruit is them removing the lineages and the history, of the true history, and distorting it. And this goes back to Akhenaton and his, uh, what I believe to be his second wife, according to our fellows. Some say it's Nefertiti. So Akhenaton had two wives. He had Nefertiti and Kia as well. We get certain even products uh, named Kia, don't we? Uh, in today. So, uh, in uh, Genesis, a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from there it was parted into four heads, or we can interpret that into uh, branches. And, uh, let's see if this is on the next slide. So, you can see also from the previous image, they were depicted as being naked in the garden. Alright, so this nudity theme is also. Okay, come with, with uh, the story of Adam and Eve and the depictions we have of, of Adam and Eve through you know, the paintings of Michelangelo and so on. Uh, in this era, there was only one river that flowed through a garden and split into four branches. This was the River Nile in Egypt. So, the garden of the god Eton, or Atom, whichever way you want to pronounce it, was either Egypt itself with the Nile River or it's talking about the Nile Delta. Or it might be talking about the actual physical garden uh, he created for the God itself. So one of the things they always did was to build a great garden for their God. And uh, a paradise, uh, because that's what it's called in Persia. So the word in etymology of paradise, from late Latin, paradisus, a park, an orchard, the Garden of Eden as well, that's what it's referred to but it actually stems from an Iranian source similar to Avastan, peri, uh, Peridesia, Peridesia, enclosure or park. In modern Persian Arabic, it's also known as Firdos, garden of, or paradise. Um, so yeah, it wasn't this, it wasn't the Euphrates or uh, the river Tigris. A garden to the god was known as a paradise, and that could well have been the garden of the god Eton, the garden of Eden. So you see how the similarities of the pronunciation of the word, Eton, Eden. And another thing to bear in mind, probably be in another slide as well, is in Hebrew, the letter T is replaced by the letter D. Isn't that interesting? Uh, there is a link to the creation myth to Egypt. Could Adam and Eve be Akhenaton and Kia, his second wife? Some speculate it was his first wife Nefertiti, but according to ancient Egyptian writings of Akhenaton, he venerated the beauty of his second wife Kia. So um, it's also my view and uh, Raphael's view as well that it could, that Eden, um, Eve would have been uh, Kia. Also, that translates interesting as well for you to translate Eve and into Hebrew and then back into there is a relation actually through the uh, linguistics uh, channel. But I'll, that, that can be left for another day, otherwise, I'll be here all day linking uh, words and names. It just so happens that Akhenaton and uh, Kia used to stroll through the Garden of Eton naked. We have many depictions and statues of this. They didn't just do it privately, they did it publicly, publicly also. So uh, there's also depictions on um, their, uh, their temples where you have them also giving out awards in their ceremonies and they do it naked as well. Or semi-naked, they wear like a robe and you can see, their, you know, you can see, see them pretty much in the nude. So yeah, here are some, some images so you can see the, the naked depictions as well from various museums in the world of uh, some say it's Nefertiti but there's actually, if you look at these there's no really any inscriptions to say whether it was Nefertiti or Kia well it was one or the other but uh, I'll leave it to you to, to discern which one that was also it's interesting how Akhenaton also looks a bit like a female <laughs> it's very effeminate isn't he? So. I th yeah, they were painted and, yeah. and they were worn out. But uh, paint, uh, depict clothes? Well, 
to, to, for the shape like that. No, no, I agree um, because I think Greek, Greek statues, they do have plate Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they do. And we have a lot of Greek... A question, yeah, yeah, absolutely. But also in Greek statues, you'll notice yeah. a lot of them are naked as yeah, well. Yeah. Well, I said, so when they get close, it's already, uh, I'd say, um, the sculptor already put the drapery. Yeah, with the drapery on with top. The, yeah. But the, you can see here in the sculpt, you can't see any drapery or anything above their bodies. So it really shows that they did walk around pretty much naked uh, most of the time. So here's another depiction as well, praising, praising Atom. And you can see that this, uh, this is the original one here on, on your left, and uh, an artistic impression of how it was coloured during that time. But you can see, again, the solar symbology, which we'll cover a bit later. And I think some of you have seen a lot of solar symbology, whether it's in a church, in a, you know, in a synagogue, or even in, in a mosque. I've seen plenty. South America. Yeah. We have them all over the world, yeah. Yeah, South America, they're always, the Incan, the Mayas. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty much all over the world. Uh, and it's very common, this solar symbology. They don't worship the sun. No, it's it's uh, it, they worship a false light. Again, it's uh, it's it's the illusion of the sun. And when we talk about reality, we know that in a way this is a sort of hologram, uh, where atoms are ninety nine point nine percent space, um, and what they are, what they have done is they've taken the ancient. See, solar worship has been around a long time. It's more ancient than than the Hyksos, or maybe not, maybe they were involved in the pre-Diluvian times, but the spiritual practices, even when we go to Druidic cultures, um, the sun was venerated and celebrated in, in those cultures. But uh, there was also, what's missing here is the feminine aspect of, of the uh, old worship of, of these deities. So uh, what Akhenaten did was ultimately separate all the other deities which were pagan in, in nature in, in origin and we have many links many links which i'll go into in another talk uh between the druidic celtic cultures and the egyptian cultures and there is in even amongst the alternative historians ralph ellis would say that the egyptians traveled all the way from egypt when they were uh, exiled which we'll go into in that story as well, and travelled all the way up to the British Isles eventually, and this is why we get the uh, the Scottish Chronicles, which I'll go into as well in this talk, uh, how they refer to. But Michael Sarin has a different view. He feels that the Irish uh, civilizations are actually much older than the Egyptian ones, or somehow the fact that they were linked, um, there is not enough evidence. But he he leans towards the fact that after the great flood happened, um, the last survivors of, of the pre-flood era um, were uh, travelled across the world. A lot of them, uh, a lot of these Druidic priests, or uh, what I like to call the High Aria, travelled to, to find the last survivors of, of, of humanity to spread the, the spiritual teaching so they can survive and that we don't start from scratch again completely. Um, so we have many references in China. Uh, like we said, I mean, all over the world we see this, this symbology and these great monolithic structures, pyramids built uh, around the world. So it's not something small to just dismiss and say it's a coincidence uh, that these, these structures are there, archaeologically speaking. So, yeah, there is no archaeological evidence of Akhenaten and Kia uh, that, that, who died in uh, Armana or even Egypt. Armana was their city, one of the cities they retreated to after their exile. Um, according to the Scottish Chronicles, uh, which was written in the 14th, 14th century, the Irish and Scots came from Egypt, according to those. But we don't know, I mean, this is written way, way later. Right after all this, these events happened. So we don't know if this document was written by Masonic or um, 
you know, Masonic interest to distort the history because we find as well, um, when you do your own research into Egypt, we find uh, red-haired and blonde-haired uh, tombs and mummies in Egypt as well. So we have evidence of, of the... Of the uh, that was also found in North America, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's to do with the Vikings as yeah. well. And uh, some speculate that this was before the flood even, that, that somehow we were all connected. Somehow we were all connected. Uh, all the races were connected throughout the world. And, um, Have you ever come across the Tartarians? I, I'm, I'm currently researching a bit more on that. Yeah. I, I don't want to speak too much about no. it. But you've got Tartaria I think and Maria. Who was connected to it? Sorry, it's possibly through the Tartarians. You've got Tartaria and what? Sorry? You said Tartaria. You're Tartaria, Lemuria, and Atlantis. But, Lemuria. They all, uh, but you have Lemuria. different timelines of these. We don't yeah. know. Because Atlantis, as far as I know, seems to be later after Tartaria and Lemuria. But Lemuria and Tartaria, we still, again, there's so much missing information yeah. and missing links about this pre. Because, as you say, it's all very fragmented in that as well. Very fragmented. From what I've um, from a little bit tough to pick up the Tartarians, Encompassed America as well, didn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So from Russia, from Russia, right through to South America, to so North America, America. Um, and that was a peaceful race, and they ended up to do um, sand frequencies and, and things like that. Mm. Well, this but, is this is a speculation, and we're still yeah. we're still trying to find out whether the uh, the survivors in Ireland and how who who were the people that survived after the flood? Was it just in in the, around the British Isles? Um, some parts of Normandy as well as, as Ireland um, but predominantly Ireland we get a lot of these monolithic structures you know, including today we have Stonehenge we have uh, Silvery Hill which um, some of us <coughs> have been to um, but yeah or was it the other way around basically Pharaoh I as well is, came after uh, Tutankhamun he was thrown out of Egypt also during the exile. So we had the mass exodus, the mass, ex mass exile of Akhenaton, his high priest and his family. But uh, they did try to get back in into Egypt and infiltrate again. And we'll see why later and how they did that. In the Gospels, Exodus, uh, Aaron and Moses should actually refer to Akhenaton and his brother Thutmosis. Thutmosis. This is where we get the name Moses from. So again, a distortion of how the biblical telling is of uh, these names, but we find like these, you know, Aaron, Moses, the A with Akhenaton, and Thutmosis, or Thutmosis. It's a thousand years before or something, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll go, some say, now, I, I think it's around 300 years, but yeah. some say it's a thousand, it's really hard to tell, but what we can see from the timelines according to archeological dating, if that's anything to go by, uh, it's about 300 years difference. Yeah. Um, no, you look at Ashkenazi, you've got no, there's no connection with them Ashkenazi Jews, is there? Yeah, well, Ashkenazi as well, you can refer it to Akhenaton in a way. Yeah. There's a very yeah. similar sort of ring to it. So, the Hyksos. Uh, the Hyksos were hill people, also known as shepherds or shepherd kings. Um, from Western Asia. They invaded Lower Egypt and occupied it for about 150 years. Uh, they utilized superior bronze weapons. So we have to remember that these people are actually quite advanced with technology. Uh, and um, hence today, you know, all the technologies have come through these, these, uh, you know, these cults. And uh, yeah, they had chariots and boats to help them invade Egypt. The Egyptians learned how to build chariots from the Hyksos. Okay, so we've got to give them some credit. <laughs> Within 50 years, they managed to take control of the important Egyptian city of Memphis, what we know today as Memphis. They were a mighty military force who also destroyed Jericho on their way through, through their exile. Some, some say it was around half a million that were exiled, uh, that went with Akhenaton um, to, back to Jerusalem. Uh, Amen, uh, Amenemhet I of the 12th dynasty, uh, which is circa nine, uh, 1991 to 1962 BC, is believed 
by a few Egyptologists to be Abraham of the Old Testament. Okay, so this is when we, we go into that history. Okay, so others say Amenhotep um, the third is uh, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? Is believed to have been Joseph, the wealthy Hebrew dream analyst with the uh, coat of many colours. So we have references to that as well, that he wore this coat. And again, they glorify their own family dynasties, their own lineages. This is what they do. Um, and we see that even today amongst the royals. So we'll break there.